we have popcorn, which means for today's Monday's matinee, we are doing Steve Collins' Will the Real Pharaoh of the Exodus please stand up on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Today, we are doing a Egyptologist Reacts video to Steve Collins' Will the Real Pharaoh of the Exodus Please Stand Up? Now, like all the other previous popcorn videos we've done, we first look at, say, who the speaker is that we are assessing, and his message, of course. Today's video is a presentation that... Steve Collins did for the Northwest Creationist Biblical Archaeology Conference. Now, Steve is best known for his excavations at Tel El Haman, which he identifies as the biblical Sodom. Now, I'm not going to comment on his excavation for the biblical Sodom because I've done that in other presentations. But we're going to discuss today his views on, say, the Exodus. But let's look, first of all, into his credentials, because I think this is something that we really do need to focus on more than we often do. So I've got here a snapshot from his CV. Okay, Now, this is the CV that he uses for his teaching gig at Veritas Evangelical Seminary. Now, when we look at his CV, it looks really, really impressive to begin with. And that's until you start sort of teasing it apart. Now, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology from New Mexico University. Fantastic. Great school. No problems there. And then he holds an MDiv at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Another great school. Okay. This is looking good so far. Then he has a Doctor of Ministry from Luther Rice Seminary. Now, in theological colleges, the Doctor of Ministry, also known as a D-Min, is sometimes called the Easy Doctorate. It's a professional doctorate designed for pastors, and it's meant to improve pastoral practice. It's a professional doctorate. It's not a research doctorate. And it's gotten the nickname of the Easy Doctorate because the requirements are a lot less than a research doctorate or a PhD. In this particular case, the D-Min is usually wrapped up in two years. And the writing requirements are very small. Like, for example, uh, your typical D-Min dissertation is generally about 50 pages, whereas a PhD is typically 350 or more. And a PhD will roughly take between 3 and 15 years to complete, depending on the complexity of the subject involved. So, this is why it's kind of gotten the nickname the Easy Doctrine. Now, that alone is, is okay. I mean, a demon is a perfectly respectable degree, although that does not make Steve a expert in the ancient Near East or in archaeology. But he also has listed on his CV two PhDs. And I think this is where things start going off the rails. His first PhD is in Biblical History and Religion, and he says it's from Trinity Theological Seminary. The problem is that's not really the name of the school. The name of the school is actually Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. And the problem is this school is actually a degree mill. All right? What a degree mill is, is it's a fake institution. It's essentially a place that you pay them money and then they print you off a certificate without you having to do any work or so little work 
that you might as well just have been given the certificate. It's essentially a way to defraud having earned a PhD. And anyone who's done this much legitimate education knows the difference between a degree mill and a legitimate school. So I don't understand how a guy with this much education, good education, he's got three good degrees here, has to resort to a degree mill. It makes no sense to me. It's, it's crazy. You know, why do this? But it gets worse. It just, it doesn't get better with the second PhD. In some ways, this is even more problematic than the degree mill. His second PhD is from Trinity Southwest University, which is an unaccredited college. The problem here is that Steve Collins co-founded this college. So he's essentially giving himself a PhD. You know, you're going to have to start asking, this, this is raises some very problematic questions about the legitimacy of this PhD in archaeology and biblical history. Those questions include, who is his supervisor? Who is his dissertation supervisor? Who is on his dissertation committee? Who is his teachers when he took classes? It sounds a whole lot like he was teaching himself all the way through. That's not a PhD. That's correspondence learning. Uh, this is, this is, this has just got fraud written all over it. It's just, this is all of this is, this is two, last two PhDs are really, really problematic. And it's really, really surprising that somebody with an academic history like this would be, well, first of all, teaching it at, at a, a place like Veritas Evangelical Seminary that's trying to present itself as a bona fide school and even has gotten accreditation. But to, to so associate yourself with a guy who's basically defrauded degrees is, wow, it, it's deeply concerning. It's incredibly deeply concerning. Uh, so with that said, let's get into the video and let's see what his views are concerning the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Okay. How do you find the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Piece of cake. Piece of cake, huh? Again, I go back to the idea that if you don't ask the right question, you might not be able to the right answer, the answer you see. Oh, I agree. If you don't ask the right question, you're, you're not going to get the right answer. The problem is people are always asking the wrong question when it comes to the Pharaoh of the Exodus. They always ask, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Instead of asking, where was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? You ask where the Pharaoh of the Exodus was, it becomes very clear, clear who he was. But that's not the question he's going to ask here. He's going to ask a completely different question. There is only an, by the way, I have never seen the right question asked on any material I've ever read by anybody, anytime, anywhere, from any point in history as to who's the pair of the exodus. I've never seen anybody ask the only question they should have asked. There's only one. Oh, it's the only question we should ask. Okay. One question. Here it is. I don't know if it's up here. Oh, yeah. If all the terrible things associated with the Exodus actually occurred in Egypt, even remotely as the Bible describes it, what would have happened to Egypt? I mean, that's, that is such an obvious question. So therefore... It's also a question that's wrapped up in an incredible amount of pretext. The problem with asking the question of if all these things happen to Egypt, we should expect to, uh, Egypt to collapse, therefore we should look for that collapse. 
is that it's reading certain assumptions into the biblical text. That's not good exegesis of the biblical texts. That's taking your presumptions and grafting it onto the text. It's eisegesis. A very subtle form of eisegesis, but eisegesis nonetheless. So I think there's a lot of assumptions wrapped up in his one question that are concerning. Especially if you want the answer to the question of who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. What you do is you would look for, well, first of all, you got to get what I call the chronological ballpark. That's pretty easy. I, I wouldn't even waste too much time messing with that. Is it? You just take the earliest possible date for the Exodus ever proposed and the latest possible date for the Exodus proposed. And you say, okay, where in that ballpark did Egypt collapse on the way of these Exodus? By the way, the answer to that question is, we're looking at the time frame is all of the 18th and 19th dynasties. So we have proposed dates in the 18th dynasty. 15th century. We have proposed dates going down to the 19th dynasty, 13th century. Okay, you have a lot more proposed dates than just that. You've got proposed dates going to the pyramid age of the old kingdom. And you have proposed dates going to the 8th and 9th century BC. You're sort of cherry picking your window here. There's a lot of proposed dates. So if you're saying the proposed dates of all the proposed dates that have ever been done, you're missing a few. Like Argzma's like 2000 BC proposed date of the Exodus. So, it's a little more complicated than that. So, he's either he hasn't done his reading here, or there's... He's sort of cherry-picking it. So, we'll give, we'll give an entire spread of the 18th and 19th dynasty as our ballpark, and examine the ballpark and find out when Egypt collapsed. And it only happened once. Yeah. Uh, it's more complicated than that. There weren't two collapses or two near collapses, or two almost collapses. There was only one big collapse. It's very big, it's very obvious, and it only happened just one Huh. All right, so how long should it take us to identify the pair of the X's? As fast as it takes us to run through the 18th dynasty. All right, here we go. Here's the ancient Near Eastern, the Ixos period. By 1700 BC, the Semitic people from Canaan had overrun the Egyptian Delta region, Lower Egypt, and uh, they ruled, uh, they woke up one day and they said, hmm, there's about 10 of us for every one native Egyptian hop in there and charge you or not. And so, they took over. Uh, we won't debate how they took over, why they took over, but we just say they did and they did. Now, Theban Egypt was then a vassal state of the powerful Pixos. And uh, what's interesting here is that you've got to look at this. They actually ruled all the way up, this was their homeland, so they ruled all the way up into the Levant. So they had control over all of this area. Now, in the north, we have to talk about some other kingdoms. Now, why are we going to talk about so many kingdoms that you never heard of? Because they play prominent roles in this whole thing. And we know the Egyptians are not going to ever tell us the truth. Right. They're inveterate uh, liars, uh, propagandists <laughs> for their own purposes. Okay, uh, I don't think that's quite fair. The Egyptians were not inveterate liars, and they weren't necessarily propagandists. The fact is that the monuments of ancient Egypt that survived are religious monuments. And just like in Israelite religion, where people didn't offer the spotted lamb to Yahweh, the Egyptians didn't offer defeats to their gods. For the Egyptians, victories were offerings. So they're not giving their gods damaged offerings, because that's what a defeat would be. It's a damaged offering. 
the Egyptians are giving the best of their victories in praise of their gods. So I, I, I don't think this assessment is either accurate or fair. One thing you don't do in the Near East is advertise your weaknesses. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about other cultures. And um, one of them is Mitanni. Uh, sometimes you see it with two T's and one N, and sometimes you see it with one T and two N. Uh, as Randy says, two T's and one N, and one N. So there you go, Mitanni. Who are these guys? Indo European Hurrians. Indo-European speaking folks uh, uh, speaking a language that eventually gives rise to the European languages and so on. Um, and they're ruling over a Semitic population of northern Mesopotamia during this period, um, starting to rule about the time that Hyksos rise in Egypt. Um, Mitannis, very strong. We got some other folks down there. The Assyrians, you've heard of them. Now the Assyrians, at this time, are appended to Mitanni. They are a vassal state of the Mitanni king. Well, we put them in here because they're going to play a role here shortly. Then we have another group, Hati. Hati, that's what that is. Hati. And the Hati folks are from the land of Hati, thankfully, not some other folks. And so all the terminology lines up. Now, who are the Hatians? They're the biblical Hittites. <laughs> By the way, the Bible is not called Hittites. They're called men of Hat. The, the, the word is identical to what the Hittites call themselves in the period. The men of Hat or Hati. And I wish we could talk chronology and talk about why in the world there are Hatians and Philistines in the time of Abraham, which there were. Um, very easy to see. Well, the reason why there are Hittites during the time of Abraham is because the famous Hittites of, say, the 18th and 19th dynasty, that's the new Hittite empire. But Hittites had many other faces, too. There's a middle kingdom and an old kingdom. And it's those previous kingdoms that overlap with the time of Abraham. So anyway, here are the kingdoms, here are our players. Now, let's play this thing out. The um, Hyksos were driven out of Egypt by Ahmosis in, in his 19th year. Some say around 1540 BC, some say 1541. 1538 is probably closer. Um, you never know about these things exactly, but this is somewhere in there. Um, so he drives the Hyksos out of Egypt for the first time uh, in a long time, 150 years. Hyksos had been there, he kicks them out. And not only that, but he walls them up the, the eastern border of Egypt. From the Suez to the Mediterranean, he builds walls, forts, canals, and uh, just shores that thing up. Why? Because he's going to kick these people out, not the people, the rulers, the, the armies. He runs them out. And enslaves the rest. Okay, so he's so enslaved. Oh, he institutes an official 18th dynasty policy of enslavement of and hatred of Asiatic slave people. Okay, that's an overstatement. Now, most of the first did not institute a policy of enslavement of Asiatics. He instituted a policy of enslavement of Asiatic settlements or cities. Asiatics that happened to live inside his territories before he went on conquest were not part of that enslavement process. So if someone had been a Asiatic living in Thebes, they weren't automatically enslaved. It's because of the way Akmos I did his conquests that as he conquered Hyksos cities, these were being viewed as foreign towns. And because they're foreign towns, they were subject to enslavement. So it's a, it's, it's a little different than saying that he had a policy of enslaving Asiatics. 
including all those good Hebrews from the patriarchs who are now down there, the tribe, tribes of uh, Israel, sons of Jacob. All right, so he enslaves them. And not only that, he walls Egypt up to protect them from that ever, from any of those incursions ever happening again. And Egypt, from this point on, now not in his reign, but eventually, what they're going to do is they're going to keep on over and over and over again attacking Canaan and Syria in slave raids and keeping the area sufficiently depopulated to avoid a repeat of the Hyksos debacle. Well, they did the same thing to Nubia or Kush as well, so. I mean, this, was a, this was a horrible, ugly period for the Egyptians. Having been ruled over by, by Semitic and Judaics, this was terrible. So they were going to make sure this never happened again. Now, um, by the way, let me go back to Akhmos. So what does he do? If you have just reunified Egypt, there's always two Egypts, one upper, one lower, and two crowns. When you, when you unify Egypt after 150 years of really a bad period, economically bad, not really uh, good at all, what do you do? He spent his entire reign building infrastructure, rebuilding the economy, rebuilding the army. In other words, just fixing things. That's what he does for his whole period. Um, his son, my son, his son, is kind of a cousin, and uh, he comes to power, and he does the same thing. Basically, Egypt is just still fixing, 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 fixing. I'm going to go through this pretty fast. But things are getting better. It's getting better. It's getting stronger. Finally, we come to Moses the first. Now, he wakes up one morning, and he thinks, well, I got the army. The army's back, good shape. Economy's back, great shape. We got so much gold coming in from Nubia, we don't even know what to do with it. Kingdom's strong, infrastructure's strong, everything's strong. I think we need an empire. Yeah, they didn't really wake up and say we need an empire. What they did was they woke up and said we need to protect our 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 borders and our assets. I mean, sometimes that's how empires start, is just by saying, well, we need a buffer zone. And the fact is that Egypt's buffer zone were these these hegemonic territories like the Levant like Nubia, like Libya. He's the first Egyptian in history, first Egyptian pharaoh in history, to have imperial vision. We're going to expand the kingdom. And you know, where, you know what his, his vision was? Let's put... Well, that's not quite true. Some of the Middle Kingdom kings also campaigned into the Levant. So, Tutmosis I is not the first to do this. Push the border of Egypt from the Pelusiac branch of the Nile. Whoa. Oh, that happens. There we go. Look how when they put the laser button right next to the advanced button. Um, Pelusiac branch of the Nile right here. Let's move the border of Egypt from there to the Euphrates River. Great! Problem. The Matani, who locked up this land between the Euphrates here and the Tigris here, who ruled this land, also had a corridor to the sea. Why? Because that's where the money was. The money is in the Mediterranean trade, the economy is in the Mediterranean basin. So they're landlocked here. But what they want is access to the co to the coastal cities of the north. And thereby they have the Mediterranean trade. Who else wants the Mediterranean trade disposed? Egypt. Egypt has no problem with it because they're, they're going to hold Egyptian coast. The Hittites want it. The Hittites badly want to control this area. Problem. Matani is too strong for them. Because this is stretching, this is stretching Hittite supply lines a little too far from the capital here, Pertussis. A little bit too far. They can't really do much about it. So the Hittites really want it, but they can't do much about it. They're dreaming about it, but it's not happening. All right? That's the world in the time of Tutmosis the first. Now, what does he do? He drives his armies all the way to the Euphrates River. 
takes his armies and drives them all the way to the Euphrates River, sets up a great big stela, big billboard, stone billboard on the Euphrates River that says, you know, how great he is. I'm wonderful, I'm the king of the world, I'm Tutmos the first, and this is the new Egyptian border on the Euphrates River. Great. Turns around and marches back home about the time. And by the way, he's gone to every city in the region, one, one at a time, and basically said, you, got, you can either become a nice cooperative vassal state of, of Egypt and be part of our territory, or you can die. Which will it be? And they all say, no, no problemo. <laughs> you got it. And so he thinks everybody's just really fine with all of this. And by the time he gets over the hill, going home, guess what happens? There you go. Matani comes back in and says, you what? You're going to come back with us, aren't you? Or die? Oh, sure. Yeah, Tumbles, the, yeah, he's gone. No problem. So they, they immediately... Yeah, vassals flip-flopped all the time. You know... <laughs> Yeah, this was par for the course. This is why Egyptian kings had to campaign multiple times. It's because they would go in, break a few skulls, and as soon as they turn around and leave, they would switch sides again. Okay? So, this was actually fairly normal for um, campaigns in, in Egypt. So, yeah. I, I don't know if, if Thutmose's the uh, first actually expected that those he conquered would stay conquered, but, you know, this was just the standard operating procedure. Immediately revert right back to the, to the Matani. Well, Moses uh, thinks he's got all this locked up, but it's not happening. So what has he got? He's got an empire in his head. He's got imperial visions, but he really doesn't have much reality behind it. Oh, he goes up periodically and beats up on a few Canaanite and Syrian kings, but he really doesn't have this thing locked down. He thinks he's got it, but you notice that I haven't you know, put a lot of weight to it. It's a little bit ethereal. All right. Come to Moses the second. Same thing. Same thing. Uh, he dies a little young. He dies a little young, but he also comes to the throne really young. Tutmosis the second is 12 when he comes to the throne. And we think his uh, wife had something to do with it. And I'm yeah, that's kind of sterile conjecture. Shepset um, always wanted to be king, not queen. She was queen, but she wanted to be king. She wanted to be pharaoh and rule everything. And he died fairly young. And probably, you know, she slipped a little, little glass into the oatmeal periodically, something. And, and uh, so. Yeah, I, I don't think you'd find any... There's no evidence that uh, Hatshepsut killed her husband, Tutmosis II. You know, we don't, we don't have any evidence for that. No, it's, it's empty conjecture. So when he says, we think this, who's we? It's, it's not the bulk of Egyptologists that think that. It is true that uh, Hatshepsut thought she deserved the throne. You know, as the daughter of Amenhotep II, or uh, sorry, Amenhotep I, she did, was in the royal line. However, to say that she murdered her husband, uh, there's no evidence for that. She dies, and then she comes to power. However, she is not the crown prince. She is not supposed to be Pharaoh. She takes over as Pharaoh. The crown prince, little Tutmosis III, is only five years old. Well, he's really the Pharaoh, but she's gonna sort of take care of things until he can get older enough to, to take over. And so, in short, wish we had time to tell all these stories because they're lots of fun. Um, she rules for the next 20 years. And by the way, she's pretty good. She's tough. She really can handle things. She does a really good job. She also had the support of the entire royal court. That's how she maintained her control. 
it wasn't so much that she was so competent as well as she was so well connected. The entire royal court supported her. So when she usurped the throne, and everyone knew she usurped the throne, you know, that was an open secret. But she was able to do so because she had the backing of the entire royal court. And no one was going to impose that. She's running armies up into, up into the Asiatic territories, and she's taking care of business. Oh, and by the way, who's really taking care of business in the Asiatic territories? None other than Tilmosis III, the pharaoh, who is, as all good pharaohs of the 18th dynasty do before they become king, as they all do, they become the conqueror of Batanu, Canaan, and Syria. They become the commander of the northern armies of Amun Ra. Four divisions in the north, the bulk of the Egyptian army, they become commander, sometimes at 10, 11, 12 years old. They're raised from the time they're little to, to do this. And so they, he has been the commander. Now notice, by the time she reaches about her 20th year, remember, Tutmosis was five when she took over, and now how old is he? He's 25 years old. I think he's sitting up there in the field bivouac with his, with his troops up there in Syria somewhere. And he's thinking, I'm 25 years old. My father was Pharaoh long before this. I am the Pharaoh. Why am I up here? And my auntie Hatshepsut is down there. It wasn't his mother. My auntie Hatshepsut is down there ruling Egypt. Guess what? Next thing we know, 20 years is up for her, and she's gone. And all the monuments of Egypt are having her face hacked off. Yeah, there's every indication that Hatshepsut died of natural causes. Um, the fact is that there, we have no evidence to say that she died in any other way. <laughs> and her cartouches gouged out trying to erase her memory as much as possible in a very ugly, violent way. And nobody's been able to, no historian's been able to really pin this directly on Tutmos III, but what do you think? <laughs> it's a pretty good guess. Yeah. Um, so he takes over. Now, thankfully for him, she's already wasted 20 of his years on the throne, so um, thankfully, He's got 34 more years to rule. And he, he lives a long time. So he gets to actually rule on the throne from 34 more years. So technically his reign is 54 years long. But 34 in his own right. Now, let me introduce Tumbles III because he is the coolest guy. I love this guy. If I had to be one guy in antiquity, this is him. I would be this guy. He was the greatest pharaoh in the history of Egypt bar none. He had more power, had more territory, had more gold, had more wealth, had a better economy, had everything going for him. And not only that, he's a brilliant, brilliant warrior, one of the greatest warrior kings slash generals ever in the history of, uh, of the ancient world. Okay, it is, it is true that... Uh that Tutmosis III was probably the most powerful king Egypt ever had. That's probably true. Was he the richest? You know, that's a different question. There are many that suspect that Amenhotep III was actually more wealthy. And that's the reason is because Tutmosis III had to campaign so much. And while he does get a lot of tribute through campaigning, it's also expensive to campaign. You have soldiers to feed, horses to feed, chariots to maintain, weapons to supply. You know, these are sometimes, it's sometimes incumbent upon the king to provide some of these. And that costs money. Whereas, say, a reign like Tutmos, or sorry, Amenhotep III where he's basically living in peace throughout his almost entire reign. 
He's just collecting tribute with none of the outlay and costs. So it's probable that Amenhotep III actually had more gold than Tutmosis III. We have his, his annals of, uh, of his battles, one the Battle of uh, Megiddo, is fabulously uh, recorded, uh, one of the great detailed battle accounts of the ancient world. Now, Tutmosis III is able to do one thing better than any other pharaoh since Tutmosis I, who had the imperial visions, he actually solidifies the empire. He systematically has his troops checking in, he's setting, he's actually setting up Egyptian governance at every location, and he is able to bring about a strong, strong Egypt, Egypt, Egyptian hegemony over this entire region. So ironclad control, complete total control for the first time in Egypt's history. Okay. Uh, I think that's a misunderstanding of the garrison towns. Now, when we talk about Egyptian hegemony, it's about keeping vassal states in line. One of the things that these uh, garrison towns that Tutmosis III set up, their function was as administrative centers and as, say, um, more or less, keeping the stick over the vassal states. Now, that stick was limited. A lot of these towns did not have large numbers of military personnel. Some of them only had a token contingent of military personnel. They're really more monitoring stations, to be right straight up about it. There weren't actually there to govern the other vassal towns. The princes of those towns, you know, kept their leaders. They kept their governments, as it were. But they had to provide tribute to, which was delivered to the garrison towns. So, the function of these garrison towns was really to keep an eye on the vassal states, and if one of them started to rebel, send messages to Egypt to say, okay, it's time for you guys to campaign again. These vassals are acting up. And this is what we see in, say, the Amarna letters, where some of the vassal states during the reign of Akhenaten start acting up, and Akhenaten goes, eh, I don't really care. But those vassal states hang around for a long, those vassal, sorry, those garrison towns persist for a long time. They survive well into Dynasty 20 and possibly even into Dynasty 21. So they're really not as ironclad. They didn't provide that function of creating an ironclad hegemony. I think this is one of those, those, those things that's, that's vastly overstated when it comes to, say, the administrative infrastructure that Tutmosis III puts in place. They have an empire running all the way to the fifth cataract of Nile in the south into Nubia, all the way to the Euphrates River in the north. This is Egypt. Okay? Now, things are going great. Now, of course, there's always this perennial problem. They're always having a battle against the Mitanni. They're always having a skirmish up there. And uh, so this is a problem. But, all good things have to come to an end. But there's this flashpoint that's always difficult. Um, thankfully, uh, Moses III brought his son, Amenhotep II, onto the throne. By the way, since Tutmosis I, this has all been father-son. Father-son, father-son, sorry. It wasn't before that, but now it is. That's why it's known as the Tutmosis dynasty. All right, so here's a, a, his son. He brought Amenhotep II onto the throne 10 years before he died as co-regent. Very smart move. Now, why was this smart? Because you know what would happen to the, in Canaan and Syria every time a pharaoh died? Every time they got wind of a pharaoh dying, you know what happened? Rebellion. You don't want to be, you don't want to be ruled over by these people. Why? Because they're taking... They have two commodities in Canaan. Biblically, 
These are identified always very well. Whenever a new king came to the throne, the vassal states would rebel. This is why every king in Egypt had to go on campaign for the first couple years of his reign, to basically establish the stick. There are two commodities that you got in Canaan that in Egypt and Mesopotamia can't get on their own. Not, not good anymore. Two things that Canaan had. Canaanite wine, Canaanite olive oil. Olive oil and wine, two commodities that Canaan... By the way, olive trees are indigenous to Canaan. They were eventually imported around the rest of the Mediterranean, but they are indigenous to Canaan. This is why Canaanite olive oil, Palestinian olive oil today is the best. Yeah, all that Italian and Greek stuff. <laughs> Palestinian olive oil. It's growing where God put, God put it in the first place. <laughs> okay. Olive oil and the wine of Canaan, the best. Why? Because it has that nice climate, the hills and all of that. You don't have that in Egypt. It's too hot. You can grow grapes down there, but the wine is <coughs> terrible. All right? So, what do you got? If you're a Canaanite or a Syrian, you have these great commodities. And if you're, if you're not ruled over, if you're not subject to anybody, you get to sell it. If you are subject to somebody like Egypt or Mesopotamia, you get to give it as tribute. So you got to give it away free. So you want to give it away free, or you want to sell it? You want to sell it. So they hate being an Egyptian vassal, right? So every time they get wind of the Pharaoh's death, they rebel. And they did it after Tutmosis III died. There were some rebellions, particularly up in Syria. Five Syrian state kings rebelled up in Syria when he died. And Amenhotep II, had to go take care of the problem. Here's, here's, here's how he took care of it. He marched north, found out, and by the way, he, he goes parallel. He has, uh, whoops, he has the army going north here along the way of Horus, or the way of the Philistines, the Bible calls it, going this way, and he has a parallel flotilla of ships going up the coast to follow him. He finds these city-state kings and arrests them, captures them, takes them over to his ship, ties them to the prow of his ship naked, gives them each an attendant to keep them alive, you know, you gotta keep them water, keep them alive, and he floats them all the way back to Egypt, all the way up the Nile to Thebes, cleans them up, dresses them up, puts him in all the firing, and has a great ceremony at the Temple of Luxor, in which he personally doesn't have someone do it himself for, the, for him. He has it, it done by his own hand. He cuts all their heads off. He personally executes them by cutting their heads off. This guy's tough. Now, his father, the great Tutmosis III, greatest pharaoh in the history of Egypt, had a lot of class. A lot of finesse. So he probably, well, he's probably rolling over in his grave to get this activity. He probably would be happy with it. But Amenhotep II is a thug, a self proclaimed thug. I mean, he says, he's the, and by the way, we have his mummy. We have the mummy of all these, all these guys, the whole 18th dynasty man. And uh, Thomas III looks just like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> in death, he looks like Abraham Lincoln did in life. I mean, really, it's just like him. And, um, but, but his son, Amenhotep II, he's got a little, little bit, few, little different genes in there. He's short, squat, wide, strong, powerful man. And in fact, he said he had a composite bow so strong that only he could pull it. That was his biggest boast. But anyway. Well, physical prowess was part of the job. You know, how else are you going to protect the food supply in Egypt from foreigners that want to come in and steal it? So to be an effective king of Egypt, you had to show physical prowess. This is why the Egyptians had the Hebsad Festival, is to show that an elderly king was still able to physically perform the job. Because the king was not just a religious leader and not just a military leader, he was the symbol that, that showed that 
Egypt was, its food supply was protected from invaders. So these boasts served a very, very practical purpose in ancient Egypt. They weren't just idle boasts. They were proof that the king could do the job. Um, tough guy. But Egypt, now notice what's happened from the day of the first day of the dynasty from Ahmosa, things got better, kept getting better. Things got really strong under Thutmose III. They were continuing to get better during his reign. Oh, by the way, when we finished the, the, the ceremony, he cuts all their heads off. Has their bodies chopped into little pieces. A little notes attached to them. And he ships them all over the kingdom, all over Syria and Canaan. And the note basically says, don't mess with Amenhotep II. That's the last problem he had with them. All good things come to the end. Well, he has to campaign after that, so didn't quite come to an end with that. But the kingdom got stronger, the kingdom didn't get weaker. I'll tell you why. It has now been suggested by Redford that Tutmosis IV just might be, just might be the greatest pharaoh of all, of all the Egyptian pharaohs. Why? Because he did something that None of his predecessors had ever done. Not only was he already known by about age 12 as the conqueror of Syria and Canaan, because he became the commander of the Northern Armies, but he was a great charioteer, always depicts himself as the greatest charioteer ever in the history of Egypt. But he had an idea. He kept saying, he kept thinking this, you know what? Every time we have to go up here, and keep this border at the Euphrates River, we're always having to butt heads with the Matanis. Why are we doing this? Why don't we make them an offer? We got more gold than we know what to do with. Why don't we make them a little why don't we make a little brotherhood pact with them and just nail this thing down forever? They can become our blood brothers, I'll take a princess and uh, we'll put her in the harem down here, and now we'll all be a happy family, and they can declare the Euphrates as the northern border of Egypt, So we don't, and they can become our guardian of that border against all comers in the region. They'll guard it for us, and not only that, because they're our blood brother buddies, we will give them all access to the Mediterranean through that corridor that they want. It's a happy arrangement for everybody. It was brilliant. The only downside was this. We know for about, for about 50 years prior to his time, both the Matanians and the, and the Hittites in their embassies in Egypt had been trying to put a, put a deal together, a treaty together with Egypt. The, the, the Hittites really wanted to get this treaty. Okay. Uh, the, the tree with the Mitanni was a brilliant idea. Unfortunately, it wasn't at Moses the Force. The first evidence we have that such a treaty was struck was after the final campaign of Amenhotep II. So we have evidence now that Amenhotep II actually had a treaty with the Mitanni. And even some evidence that the Mitanni came down to Egypt asking for military aid because it appears that the Mitanni during the reign of Amenhotep II was experiencing pressure from the, the uh, newly upstart Assyrian you know, self-rule and the Hittites. So they were getting squeezed from both sides at that point. So it already seems to be that in Amenhotep II's ninth year, there was a, at least the beginnings of a treaty with the Mitanni. To cut the Mitannis out and put them in so they have access to the corridor. But Thomas IV chose, well, for him, he chose wise. We actually have very few records from Thutmose the Fourth, so we don't really know what 
Tutmosis the fourth did because he didn't reign that long and there wasn't really a lot that survived his reign. We have a chapel from Karnak Temple, but it doesn't have a lot of texts. For the rest of the history of Egypt, for the next dynasty, <coughs> wasn't a very good choice because he should have sided with, with Hathi for the long haul. However, uh, in short sightedness, and it was good for Egypt at the time, he sided with Mitanni, and guess what? Before the ink was dry on that treaty, Hati became the sworn enemy of Egypt. Not quite. It's a little more complicated than that. Hati was angered. They were they because between the power of Egypt and the power of Mitanni combined in this region, there is no way they're getting to that, they're getting the northern uh, uh, Syrian corridor. They're not going to get it. They want it. They can't get it. So now they are the enemy of Egypt. Well, we know in the Amarna letters that during the reigns of, say, Amenhotep III, going back even as far as Tutmosis IV, Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, and even into the reigns of, say, Semenkare and Tutankhamun, that Egypt maintained the its hegemony in the Levant. Nothing they can do about it. Well, um, Tutmosis IV is seen as a brilliant pharaoh for, the, for this reason. Now Egypt doesn't have to expend all the funds all the time to go guard this region. It's all happy, happy love, love fest, and everybody's just having a great time. Egypt is now stronger than it ever has been. It is not having to just expend funds on military activity in the north. So they have the strongest uh, that they've ever had. Now, something happened. We've got this egypto matanian alliance by the end of his reign. Hachi's been cut out. <laughs> but something happens. Tutmosis IV dies an untimely death. He dies between age 25 and 30 years old, by 27 ish. And watch what happens when he dies. First thing that happens is the egypto matanian alliance evaporates. Uh, not true. That alliance is, is ratified at least again during the reign of Amenhotep III. So that's just not true. In fact, by this time, King Tushrata of Mitanni has been writing letters. We have some of them in the Amarna tablets, in the Amarna letters in Egypt. Keeps writing letters to Amenhotep III saying, Where's my gold? What's wrong? You know, why aren't you. Okay. Those letters are not exactly, where's my gold, okay? Those letters are that the Egyptians sent royal gifts that were then melted down for gold. And question, wait, you're sending us gifts that are not the purest gold available? What, are you getting cheap on us? That's different. That's different. Egypt is sending them works of art, and they're melt. They're scrapping that art for the gold content, and then complaining that it's not pure enough gold. <laughs> That's not the same thing as ship us a lot of money. Not the same thing at all. And. We have to remember that when the Mitanni are sending those letters, Amenhotep III is on the throne. So we know from that letter that that alliance is still intact by the time of Amenhotep III and even into the reign of Akhenaten. Answering your mail. What happened to our relationship? Not, nothing's happening. Well, not only that, not only does the egypto matanian alliance dry up, the border disappears, and for some strange reason, during the reign of Amenhotep III, he withdraws Egypt entirely from the Levant. All right, that's, that's so not true. Amenhotep III does not withdraw from the Levant. Okay, that's just, that's just plain nonsense. The garrison towns are still there. 
the garrison towns are still collecting tribute. They're collecting lots and lots and lots of tribute during the reign of Amenhotep III. So much so that Akhenaten inherits one of the richest kingdoms that have ever existed. There are scarabs of Amenhotep III that are found in the Levant. Now, if he had withdrawn, there would be no scarabs in the Levant. There's even one of the most famous of these scarabs was found at Jericho. Okay? Jericho is in the Judean foothills. Now, the suggestion that Amenhotep III withdrew from, from the Levant is preposterous. It has no basis in history. Egypt pulls out mysteriously. It has been obligatory for every pharaoh up to this point for the last 150 years to have a border in the Euphrates River. And now, for some weird reason, Amenhotep III is pulling out. Yeah, that's just empty speculation. It, it's, it's, it's empty speculation that flies in the face of the data. By the way, if you're gonna if you're gonna maintain strong Egyptian strength in the area, where's your only staging area? The Delta region. If something happens here, you have to pull back. He is pulling back for some reason. Something has happened to Egypt that Egypt's not telling. Me. Yeah, that's not true. This is plain not true. There's, there's no evidence that he pulled back. Every bit of evidence that the garrison towns remained. Not only that, that there was even some campaign at some point by Amenhotep III. So the idea that he's pulled out is, is ridiculous. The fact is that he didn't have to pull out and he didn't have to campaign because he had reestablished that treaty with Matani and that treaty held. So much so that they're asked that he that the Mitanni are asking at the end of Amenhotep III's reign about the quality of the gifts he's sending. So, yeah, this doesn't this doesn't make any sense. Everybody else knows the Egyptians are not telling us that. That's why we need these other folks to tell us what's going on. Well, um, by the way. <clears throat> He rules for exactly 38 years. Very solid, uh, very solid number. 38 years. How long were the Israelites wandering before they moved on onto the plateau above the plains of Moab and then down? Well, the number in Deuteronomy is 38. 38 years they wandered. Now. Another thing happens during the reign of Amenhotep III. In about his 20th year, the Hittites march across the Euphrates River, attack the Mitanni capital of Washington, <coughs> and destroy them. Capital's gone. I just shrink Mitanni here because it's not quite gone yet. Because Sufi Luliuma, Sufi Luliuma is the Hittite king. He's going to come back later and finish the job. But for right now, Mitanni's just re reduced to this fraction of what it had. Okay, well, it's debated whether or not the Mitanni were conquered by the Hittites or annexed. The evidence at this point seems to lean towards that facing pressure and the inevitable conquest of the Mitanni by the Assyrians that the Mitanni chose to be vassals of the Hittites. So there does seem to be that sort of um, um, leaning towards a vassalage instead of conquest. Now look at this. All of a sudden, Sufi Luliuma, the great Hittite warrior king, feels free to attack the Mitanni kingdom, which is the brother of Egypt, with impunity, without fear of any reprisal from Egypt. He just marches over there and wipes them out. Hmm, very interesting. What does he know? He knows in his reconnoitering of Egypt that Egypt is not able to respond. And I promise you, Egypt would have contained control of the Levant had they been able to. They didn't because they wouldn't. They didn't because they couldn't. They could. No. No. 
it was more the fact is that the Hittites were not about to fight a war on two fronts. They were much more concerned about Mitanni than they were about Syria and the uh, Levant. Now, they are going to go start incurring down into Syria, but this doesn't occur during the reign of Amenhotep III. This occurs later on. It doesn't even occur even during the reign of Akhenaten. We have actually no evidence that the Hittites were making that incursion during that time. It's only, say, after the death of King Tut that the Hitt Hittites really start moving into the Levant. Not maintaining control. Something happened in Egypt to cause them to collapse back into, the, into their borders. Yeah, that collapse has not been established. Hati then took the corridor they always wanted. Now they've got the corridor to the sea. They've locked up north. Wait, wait. Hati took the corridor to the sea? Hati has a sea corridor. Hati controlled all of Turkey. Turkey is on the coast of the Mediterranean. It doesn't need a seaport. It has a seaport. It was Mitanni that was landlocked that needed the seaport. He's confusing his empires. We're in Syria, and here they are. Now, this is quite amazing. Assyria now has been cut loose from Mitanni, who was the brother of Egypt, now destroyed. Assyria had already been, sort of declared itself independent. Probably during the reigns of Amenhotep III or into uh, the reign of Akhenaten. Because we get an, a Marna letter from them asking for, uh, for the Egyptian king to recognize their independence and to, to sign a treaty. Assyria then grows into what we now know eventually in the late Bronze Age to become the uh, initial old Assyrian uh, empire. But we also have to re recognize too that Mitanni, Assyria, and the Hittites are all extant at the time of the Amarna letters. It's only, say, during the Ramesside period that Mitanni gets sort of annexed. But they're gaining in strength now. Now, comes the next pharaoh, Akhenaten. Akhenaten has no foreign policy. He's an embarrassment to Haram Heb, who's later going to give us the first, give me the first KD. The next dynasty after this dynasty totally collapses. This is an embarrassing period. By the way, Akhenaten changes the religion of Egypt from the typical many, many gods to a quasi or a near monotheism by declaring the sun disk, the Aten, as the new god and the only god to be worshipped. It was more of a pantheism than a monotheism. It was monolatry. It was the worship of a god that was everything and is everything. So it was a monolatrous pantheism. That's what Ottonism uh, was. Evidently, Egypt is falling apart. The Egyptian gods aren't helping one bit. And he saw his grandfather, his father collapse, and now um, he's having problems too, so he just reinvents the holy uh, religion of Egypt. Yeah, there's no evidence that the one predicated the other. There's no evidence that, that the one... Uh, the, that the collapse even collapsed. Okay? From everything we know from the Amarna letters, Egypt still had its hegemony in Canaan. He wasn't born into it, he invented it. He was born on the chapter 4. Well, we know that Ottonism existed as a cult. Uh, during the reign of Amenhotep III, because Amenhotep III actually was the first major patron of Ottonism. Now, it wasn't elevated to the to the status of being a monolatry, but it was patronized by Amenhotep III, and it was probably also patronized by Tutmosis IV as well. So. 
Atenism existed long before Akhenaten. He just took it and ran with it. Changes his name, quits worshiping Amun, comes Akhenaten, the, Herat, the beloved of the Aten. Okay, Akhenaten does not mean beloved of the Aten. Akhenaten believe, uh, um, means uh, Aten of the horizon. So it does not it does not mean beloved of the atom. Akhenaten, very bizarre period of history, but Egypt is failing. Egypt is collapsing around its ears. By the way, you know what else we know about the reign of Akhenaten that not too many people talk about? Plagues. Plagues are still somehow have started back in the reign of Amenhotep III. They're ravaging Egypt, and they're still ravaging Egypt at this time, and they're still ravaging Egypt in the time of King Tut. Plagues were perennial in Egypt. Egypt had plagues all the time. It had blights. It had famines. It was just a fact of life in Egypt. Because there was so much water and so much insect-borne disease. Plagues were just a normal, everyday occurrence in Egypt. So... Our famous King Tut, the boy king who had everything in his uh, tomb, he stole from other tombs, uh, basically thrown in there uh, at the last minute. And um, still wonderful stuff, however. But he only rules for nine years. But I want to show you what happened at the end of his rule. Look at this. When he died, his widow, Ankesanamu, was alarmed because they had no kids, no sons, no sons, no heirs. As a result of that, by the way, this is what I call the most bizarre episode in the history of the Near East. Now here is this weirdness multiplied. She writes a letter to the enemy, Supi Luniuma, king of the Hittites. And she says, Dear Supi. Well, they weren't the enemies yet. You see, the idea here that he's that he's that that uh, Collins is sort of fostering is that the Hittites were the enemies of the of the Egyptians at this point. Up to this point, the Hittites had been very, very careful not to broach Egyptian control in the Levant. It's only after this incident that Hittite's anger is, you know, focused upon Egypt. Help! My husband has died. I'm going to give you this as a verbatim quote. My husband has died. We have no sons. I hear you have many sons. If you will send one of your sons to be my husband, he will sit on the throne of Egypt. Whoa! Here's the queen. That's actually true. That's actually true. She did send a letter asking for one of the sons of Supiluma the first to marry her and come become uh, king over all of Egypt. So, yeah, that happened. Writing to the enemy Hittites, requesting one of his sons to be her husband so that he might be the pharaoh of Egypt, in essence, offering Egypt as a vassal state ruled by the son. Their number one in. <clears throat> That's just bizarre. In fact, Supi Luliuma. Well, wasn't quite a vassalage. She wasn't quite offering them vassalage. She was offering an extension to his dynasty and his 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 influence. So it wasn't quite vassalage. It was okay, your your king, your king of the Hittites. Your son can also be king of Egypt, and we can have this 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 power block pact here. So it wasn't quite vassalage, but it is a compromised diplomatic situation. Thought it was nuts. Mercilli the second, his son. We have his animals. He talks about his father raging through the palace with his hands on his head. Saying things like, what is happening here? This has never happened to me in my whole life. What are they trying to pull? 
So he sends an envoy. He sends an entourage down to Egypt to check it out. And they go down and they meet with Ankesanoni. They meet with her and she flies off the handle. She's really upset. She she's, thinks she hasn't been taken seriously. She sends another letter with the entourage back to Hattusis. Off they go. They get to Supiluliuma a few weeks later and they say, it's a real deal. Here's the letter. Read it yourself. And he reads it. She, she quotes verbatim from her first letter. My husband has died. And on she goes. And she says at the end of it, who else have I appealed to? Would I embarrass my kingdom in front of what, uh, who else? Who, what other king have I appealed to but you? And, then, and the guys are going, okay. So he picks out one of his poor sons and sends him off with an, the entourage back to Egypt. This is making a great movie. As soon as he gets close to the border of Egypt, he's assassinated. Now, do you think Supiluliuma is happy at this point? No. But here's what happens. Supiluliuma knows that Egypt is not in a position to do anything. They have just offered him themselves. And they're just given given the whole kingdom of Egypt away. Now he's going to take it by force. He's going to take it by force. And he knows they can't stop it. So where, now look at this. Well, it's not quite that simple. Egypt still has a very, very powerful military at this point. But what's happened here is he, Subi Lulim I thought he had a deal and found it was betrayed. So he's angry. He's really, really angry. But at the same time, too, Egypt at this point has a very powerful military. So it's not quite the calculation of that Egypt is weakened and he can just walk into Egypt. That's not the calculation here. He's angry that his son got knocked off and he wants revenge. He's already in, he's already in Syria. He's already camped at the anti-Lebanons here. And so all he has to do is just march down the highway to Egypt and he's got it. Guess what? He gets all, he starts putting his troops together. They start mobilizing. Everybody starts getting sick. Now, remember this entourage going back and forth from Hattusis to Egypt and back and forth? Guess what they contracted? Several of pl plagues. And we don't know what the plagues were, chickenpox, influenza, who knows? They contracted plagues, and the soldiers started dying so fast they couldn't mobilize and march on Egypt. Not only that, but the disease went all the way rapidly through the Hittite kingdom and almost took them down. Almost, not quite. They survived. What's interesting about that, I'll come back in just a minute. Now, Haramheb is an old general. He's an old general. Puts, he basically puts his, one of his old army buddies called Pharaoh I, A Y, puts him on the throne. And basically. Okay. I is not an army buddy of, of Hormheb. I was the vizier and high priest. But they. I and Hormheb were not buddies, they were rivals. They were rivals in the royal court. Okay. And it's probably during the time when Horemhead is out in the desert killing off Supiliuma's son that I sneaks onto the throne. Okay. And once he takes the throne, there's nothing Horemhead can do about it. So Horemhead is not putting I on the throne. I is coming, sneaking onto the throne again, with the support of the royal court. So, there's not much Hormheb can do about it. And both those men are elderly at this point. 
Okay. But I did not serve in the army. He was a priest. So what we got here is the end of the 18th dynasty. The 18th dynasty has crashed and burned. Now, I just want to review it. By the way, Ramesses the Great comes to the throne. There is no glitch, power glitch, in the reign of Ramesses the Great. 64 years on the throne. And except you have the entire abandonment of Avaris. No glitch except that. <laughs> oh no, that's 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 just a that's just an oversight. Yeah. Oh. Exodus can't occur there. Now sure, there's another reason why too. Ramesses, by the way, eventually has to butt his head with Hittites. They fight back and forth, all kinds of battles. Actually, a lot of people will then have to fight against the Hittites. We've got records of Horemheb fighting the Hittites. You know, this um, this succession crisis after the after the end of the reign of King Tut causes a fifty year state of war with the Hittites, and it's not just that the Hittites come in. the The scorecard in the Levant seesaws between the Egyptians and the Hittites over that fifty year course. So one side does not exactly have an advantage over the other. And even, even Ramsey's battle of Kadesh was a stalemate. Eventually, you know what the Hittites and the Egyptians do? Treaty. Treaty time. And uh, so they finally just say, hey, let's quit fighting. Let's just... Well, it did help that there was a change of regime in, in Hatti. You know, when Hattusheli III came to the throne, he was not of the line of Supiluma the, the I. So the fact that Supiluma's the uh, son got kicked off, knocked off, that was really no concern to Hattusheli III. For him, it was just, this is just one Pyrrhic victory after the other. You know, why not strike a treaty at this point? And Ramses II's son, uh, Amahir Kopchev, was a very charismatic diplomat. Very convincing. So, it just made sense for both sides to bury the axe. Draw a treaty. We'll take the north, you take the south. Let's end this thing. They did. Happily ever. Until the Hittites eventually collapsed a couple centuries later. But anyway, um, nice story. Here's what I think: the decline of the 18th, the collapse of the 18th dynasty, have to be attributable to the events of the Exodus. Yeah, I, I, I don't see it. Here they are: ten plagues, plundering of wealth, loss of labor force, loss of military delta force. They're in the delta, and call them the delta force. <laughs> okay, his list here: you know, ten plagues. He didn't show ten plagues. He showed plagues that always happened in Egypt anyway. Plundering of wealth. Well, that wealth survived well into, say, the reigns of Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, and ultimately King Tut, as we see from his lavish burial. Loss of labor force? There really wasn't a loss of labor force during any of, uh, during the Dynasty 18. I don't know what he's talking about here. Uh, loss of military power in the Delta didn't exist. You know, Akhenaten was able to campaign into the Levant. Again, I don't see it. The death of Pharaoh, again, there's nothing implied by the biblical text that Pharaoh died. So... And Loss of Pharaoh. If those five things happen to Egypt, what happens to Egypt? They collapse. And they collapse. Now, um, watch, this is even more dramatic. These are the power ratings for Egypt's 18th dynasty pharaohs based on the strength of Egyptian hegemony in Canaan and Syria. Why is that the barometer? Because in order to do that, they have to have a strong presence of power and a presence and a good economy and a good military in the Delta region. That's the only staging area for which they support and control in the north. Now watch this. <coughs> Almost no power. Just 
They're just getting Egypt back together. We get to, then we get to Tutmos the first. He gets an imperial vision. He pushes some of his troops up. But really, the hegemony is not realized until it keeps getting stronger. But in Tutmos the third's reign, now we got the power. And now we're really in control of all those northern lands. So they've been ramping up, 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 up. Everything's getting stronger, stronger, stronger. When he dies, Amenhotep cements it even further. When he dies, it's cemented even further with a treaty. Okay, so we have strong Egypt's riding high. But watch what happens in the next pharaoh. Just collapse. Yeah, this is ridiculous. This is not a scientific graph. This is, there's no scientific basis to this. This is not statistical. This is confirmation bias. This is, this is patently ridiculous. You know, you can't put hegemony and power and wealth of ancient Egypt on a graph like this. This is silly. From that point, from that point, we have a precipitous decline. It doesn't even make sense with the evidence. You know, it just makes no sense even according to what we know of the evidence. <coughs> Now, by the way, there's not going to be a total and complete collapse. Why? Because we need it for the rest of the Bible. We've got to have Shishak, and we've got to have Necro, and all the rest. Oh, so there's no room to collapse. Okay. So... <laughs> so, what we have here is a virtual collapse, not a real one. Okay. I guess we'll have to wait for the real collapse of the Egyptian hegemony in Dynasty 20 for that. But there it is. I mean, that's the only place in our entire target area, target ballpark, that's the only place. Uh, except his target area only includes Dynasty 18. He doesn't include Dynasty 19. And Dynasty 19 has its own particular sort of collapse, which is after, say, you start seeing, you get, you know, Ramses II, and then the decline during Merneptah's reign, and then followed by a usurping of the throne by Amon Messis. So, it, Dynasty 19 doesn't have, it isn't exactly a, a perfect ironclad hegemony either. In fact, this is when they start to lose it. Say, during the reign of Merneptah, and even at the end of, say, possibly the reign of Ramses II, we start seeing Egyptian hegemony challenged by the Philistines. Where do they come from? Well, they came in because the Egyptian hegemony couldn't maintain control. So by just focusing on Dynasty 18 here, he's cherry-picking the data. And if you cherry-pick the data, you get confirmation bias. And that's going to lead you to wrong conclusions. We get an Egyptian collapse. Now, what's interesting is, during the reign of Tutmosis IV, here's the power ratings in, Egypt, in, in the Near East. Egypt is number one, by far. These power ratings are fiction. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like, what's he, he's, is he playing D&D &D here with Egyptian kings? You know what? <laughs> it's like, is he giving them an 18 strength, a 16 intelligence, and a 14 charisma? I mean, how is he calculating this? You know, this is not an objective uh, rating system. It's it's fiction. Matani is number two. Hati is number three. And Assyria is number four. Now watch what happens. In the reign of one pharaoh, from the very next pharaoh, watch what happens to the power ratings. Hati becomes number one. Assyria becomes number two. Egypt becomes a distant third. And Matani is wiped off the face of the earth. Yeah, it's it's not quite that simple. I mean, he's really making the assumption that Egypt didn't have a powerful military uh, during the reign of Akhenaten, and quite the opposite is true. 
Egypt had a very, very powerful military during the reign of Akhenaten. Uh, in fact, there's only two things Akhenaten spent money on, which was essentially his own re personal religion and the military. Because he had to have the military to enforce his, his monolatrous pantheism. That's why he needed such a strong military, was to enforce his new religion. And that made the military extremely powerful by the time Akhenat uh, sorry, by the time Horemheb took the throne. In one pharaoh, just one generation, kaboom, gone. There you go. I think that's got to be it. I uh, can't explain it any other way. Well, well, here's the pharaoh. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's his papa. Uh, there's Amenhotep the second. Oh, and then we have uh, this is Tutmos the fourth. Here he is. Here is Amenhotep the second. This is Daddy. By the way, um, he would have been the pharaoh on the throne while Moses was in exile. Here's his. Here is him and his. Mom, Tia. So here's mom. And here's his uh, cartouche, Men Kefer U. It's pronounced Kepper, not Kefer. Read it like this Men Kefer U Ra. Men Kefer U Ra. By the way, that's just one letter different. Just this letter A. Men Kefer U Re. Added. His grandfather, the III, was Menkepura. He's Menkepura. And uh, so there's his little cartouche, one of them. He has five different names. Here he is, Tutmosis IV. By the way, this is uh, one panel of his chariot. His actual chariot was found in his tomb, in the hallway of his tomb, which had been robbed. Uh, but it was still there, and it has Tutmosis III. I'm sorry, Tutmos the fourth, riding over his enemies. Who are all these folks? Canaanites! Well, you can't tell the Canaanites. If you're an Egyptian, you can't tell the Canaanite. Okay, they have this typical uh, Semitic headdress. Mm -hmm. So he's riding over them. He's the perfect pharaoh. By the way, he styles himself as the greatest charioteer in the history of Egypt. He's the perfect guy to go chasing after the Hebrews out of the wilderness on a chariot. Leading his chariot forces. Um, so he fits perfectly. Here he is. Let's just get one. Oh, here we are. Here he is. Tutmosis the fourth. Isn't it weird to be able to look into the face of historical characters? We could we could do all the mummies of this dynasty and the next. We've got them all. It's really quite quite amazing. Whoops. What did I just do? Here he is. By the way, he's very handsome. Well coiffed, he's got great earrings, great manicure. But it's really interesting. I noticed one thing. Um, G. Elliot Smith did an examination, a forensic examination of all the Egyptian mummies of the 18th and 19th dynasties around the turn of the 19th century, 19th to 20th century. It's about 1900. By the way, that examination was so accurate, so complete, comprehensive, that when another team of forensic investigators about 10 years ago, 15, 15 years ago, re-examined all the mummies. They decided just to re, just to do a reprint on G. Elliot Smith's report. They really couldn't add anything to it. He said something in his uh, in his report about Tutmos the Fourth. Number one, he's healthy. He has no pathogens. He has no arrows sticking in his back. Uh, you know, he, he just he looks like he's in great shape. Except he made a, a really strange observation. Well, I thought it was strange. He says, Tumbles is the four, at the time of his death, was extremely emaciated. Now, the reason that phrase caught my attention was, from my, when it comes to mummies, from my lay point of view, all mummies look rather emaciated to me. <laughs> I mean, they all basically look like beef jerky. 
So how, you know, what was it that he was looking at? It was something about muscle mass or something. Else. Anyway, he looks at this guy, and he, said, and he doesn't say this about any of the other pharaohs. He said, this particular mummy, at the time of death, is extremely emaciated. In other words, this fellow was pining away. He was not eating right. He was not drinking right. He was worried sick. Yeah, um... The whole drawing the conclusion that Tutmosis the Fourth was worried sick and that caused his emaciation. Um, no foundation. There's no foundation for that. That's that's drawing a conclusion from insufficient evidence. You need more than that. This is one of the problems I have with Steve Collins is that he often draws conclusions based on some pretty sketchy evidence. Uh, this is why I'm reticent to support his, his, his theory of Tel el Hamam being Sodom, is because he doesn't produce the goods. He'll, he'll make these conclusions based on pretty, some pretty dodgy evidence to which there are possibly other explanations. You know, yeah, Tutmosis the Fourth might not have had any pathogens, but there's other explanations why he could have been emaciated that are based upon pathology instead of mental crises. I mean, what if he had leukemia? That would cause a wasting away and not be detectable in a archaeological postmortem exam. So because there's other explanations here, I, I don't I don't see I, I think it's insufficient for Collins to draw that conclusion. Wouldn't you be if your kingdom was falling around your ears? For months or years things are just falling apart and there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no evidence that things are falling apart here for months or years. I mean, the whole ten plagues of the Exodus occurs over a matter of months. Four months tops. Not four years. It's just, again, this is the problem with sterile supposition is you're just carving this narrative out of whole cloth instead of out of evidence. Now, you already have the question, some of you always uh, already have the question in your head, because I get asked this many times when we talk about this. Well, if this is the Pharaoh of the Exodus, how come we have this mummy? Right. I thought he died in the sea. Remember I told you earlier today, read the text. The text says that after they were killed in the water, drowned in the water, the next morning, the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the shore. Eastern shore. Now they would have sacrificed a thousand slaves to get the body of the Pharaoh. And they got it. Why did they have to get it? Okay, he says, read the text. And it's true that the bodies of the Egyptians floated after the uh, the Reed Sea closed. Okay, and the Egyptians were drowned. But the corollary to read the text is don't read into the text. Yes, read the text. But don't read into the text. There is nothing in the text that suggests that the king of Egypt drowned with his chariots. To suggest that is not reading the text, it's reading into the text. It's eisegesis, not exegesis. So yes, read the text, 
but follow the, the corollary also of not reading into the text. According to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, all of that has to be done properly in order. They have to mummify, they have to go through all the procedure, or the black land is going to get swallowed up by the, the red land. It's very bad juju if you don't do this. So they have to do it. So they got him, and they, of course, obligatorily took out all of his uh, organs and all that. And stuffed him in natron set for 70 days, and, you know, basically a picture. All right, so here he is. Uh, I think he's the pair of the exes. I don't have another choice. So what happened? Remember, when Tutmosis, when Amenhotep II, and his son came to the power, uh, everything collapsed. Everything just went backwards. What Egypt had accomplished, all of those uh, many pharaohs before him, just went undone, just came apart. And when it came apart, it was ugly. Hati marches on Mitanni. Mitanni goes out of the picture. The Egyptian brother is gone. Hati then... Uh, is being asked to save Egypt. But what's interesting about this is in the, this means that Joshua would have come in to, to conquer Canaan in the second year of Akhenaten. Forty years later, Joshua comes in under Pharaoh Akhenaten. What's really interesting about that, uh, I don't have time to talk about it. The okay, if, if Joshua comes in during the second year of Akhenaten, we have some problems here. And that for the next 15 years of Akhenaten's reign, and then into the first three, at least, you know, one year of Simancare, three years of King Tut, we have a Levant that's the Canaan that's dominated by Canaanite rulers, including the city of Hatsor. So if Joshua's coming in during the second year of King Akhenaten, we've got a real problem here because the Israelites aren't conquering the land during that period. You know, what we have here is, is a complete Canaanite control of the Levant including um, Egypt's hegemony over those vassal states. And it's very clear they are, are vassals because those kings are sending letters to, to Akhenaten and, and the Amarna period kings and basically saying, hey, I'm your vassal. So I, 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 think, I think this is baloney. Joshua, but here, here's it is in a nutshell. Remember, going all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way to Joshua and Moses, God had been promising the Israelites an Egyptian as Canaan. I'm going to give you a land in which there are Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Jebusites, Jebusites Hivites, Parasites, Termites. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but notice no Egyptians. <clears throat> if the late Bronze Age is known, and it is known as the time of Egyptian domination of Canaan, where are the Egyptians in the story of Joshua, Joshua's conquest? Okay. At the time of Joshua's conquest, which occurs during the reign of Merneptah, Egyptian hegemony had pretty much was reduced to the um, to the garrison towns. It had lost control. You know, during the reign of Merneptah, the, the Philistines were already taking over the coastal plain. You had the Israelites, you know, recorded during the campaign of, of Merneptah in his fifth regnal year. The garrison towns were completely inequipped to maintain control. And essentially, the Israelites just conquered around those garrison towns. And those garrison towns were just completely ineffectual in maintaining Egyptian hegemony. So, you know, it's more that the Israelites just walked around them. Because, again, these are not... These are not 
administration centers equipped to retake territory. They're there to collect tribute. And without the support of, of Egyptian campaigns that happened at a regular or irregular basis, those towns couldn't collect tribute anymore. So that's what happened to the Egyptians. That's why they weren't, they were just not of any import to, to uh, the Israelite conquest. Now, they are not there. I promise you, if you study this more carefully, you will see that there is a tiny historical <coughs> window in which Joshua could have possibly come into Canaan without Egyptian presence. And that's during the reign of Akhenaten. Yeah, baloney. They were they had Egyptian presence in, in the Canaan. They just didn't use it. You know. During the reign of Akhenaten, there was administrative cities. You know, Gaza was a administrative city. You know, there there was presence of the Egyptians in Canaan at the time of Akhenaten. Whether or not the Egyptians decided to use its its forces for the reestablishment of its hegemony is a whole different matter to whether or not they were present because they were clearly present. You know, basically, uh, Labaya sends his son for punishment to an Egyptian administrative center. So they were there. They were there. It's an inescapable fact. Not only that, but why did God keep them in the wilderness during the entire reign of his father? Because we had to wait until the land had Hittites. Because there was no Hittite presence, not officially. Yeah, a few uh, meandering uh, migrants here. But you have Hittite sojourners. I mean, really, the Hittites that were in Canaan, they were sojourners. Just like you had Amorite sojourners in Canaan. Just like you had Mitanni soldier, uh, sojourners in Canaan. There were a lot of sojourners in Canaan. You know, especially during that that period of depopulation. So, yeah, this doesn't make a lot of sense. There, were no, there was no Hittite presence, politically, sociopolitically, in Canaan until when? 20th year of Amenhotep III. Yeah, that's not true. That's, that's just not true. There were, there, were, there were Hittites before Amenhotep III. They were sojourners just like other, you know, uh, socio-ethnic um, groups that had wandered into Canaan. You know, <laughs> you're, I mean, Abraham, you know, buys the plot of land from the Hittites. You know, he's buying land from the Hittites. This is in the 18th century B.C., you know, you can't say there was no Hittite presence until Abenhotep III if Abraham is buying land from Hittites in Canaan. No, that doesn't make sense. So there's a tiny little window in which we're going to have Hittites, Canaanites, and Amorites living in, in the Promised Land without Egyptians. And that's exactly what happened here. When Joshua marched in, he marched into an Egyptian-less Canaan. And I'm going to cut it off right here. I wish I could talk about this, because there's some real exciting stuff here. But once you nail this down, once you've got the Pharaoh of the Exodus, at, at Tutmosis IV, everything else in the Bible lines up with precision, including the first judge and the first Oppressor in the Book of Judges. Because he is a uh, the first judge, I mean sorry, the, the first oppressor is named Kushan Rishathaim, King of Aram Naharaim. He's a Matani. He's a Matani warlord. He can't exist. But for a bit. Because the Matanis were completely wiped off the face of the earth before the end of the 14th century. By 14, 20, 14, 10, they were in history. Okay, this guy doesn't understand his history. 
Um, essentially, uh, Aram Nahraim is what is is essentially the state of Aram. Okay, Aram is what is remaining of the Mitanni. Now he says there's no Mitanni after the collapse of the Mitanni Empire. Well, that's not quite true. You know, he just quoted the uh, the passage, you know, that's talked about, you know, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Hivites. Who are the Hivites? They're the cultural remnants of the Mitanni. And the Hivites last into the period of the judges. Now, what happens is, ultimately, Eram Naharaim is, becomes Aramitized. They, they, they take on the Aramaic language. They become um, culturally Assyrian. But that takes time. And it's, and it's in the time of the judges that that, that first oppressor in the judges, you know, this is coming from that, that rump remainder kingdom of the Mitanni, which is Aram, Aram of the rivers, Aram Naharayim. So he's not Mitanni exactly. This is after, this is post Mitanni. This is post Mitanni. So these, this, these states last for a while. You know, just like after the fall of the Hittites, you have the Neo-Hittite kingdom. After the fall of the Mitanni, you have Aram Naharaim. So Collins here doesn't know his history. But then again, given his phony PhDs, he never studied this. Go on. Which means you can't have a late date for the Exodus, I'm sorry. Uh, because Kushan, Kushan is Indo-European, he belongs to the Metanian realm. He ruled, he said, Rishataim of the Risi people who are in that area, the Indo-Europeans, king of Natharaim, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. That's him, that's him, that's him. That's the only time we have Indo-Europeans ruling over Mesopotamia. That's it. Okay, that is the end of the video. Um, wow, um, that's kind of an interesting note to end on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his, his evidence for that there isn't a late date is the fact that there are no more Matani after the fall of the Matani, which is not quite true. We know that they did still exist as Hivites and as the the kingdom of Aram Naharaim. But we, we, we're, we're seeing here the problems with uh, Stephen Collins' approach to history. His approach to history is essentially, you know, he's he's reading into the text. He's taking a lot of presuppositions. And some of these presuppositions are based on, say, traditionalist readings. And he is using a confirmation bias approach to support those presuppositions. It's, it's, it's essentially a pretextual approach to history. And I don't think he has the evidence. I don't think he has the goods to back that up. So that's his... That is his video. Will the real Pharaoh of the Exodus please stand up? And clearly, Tutmosis IV isn't standing up. So anyway... Thank you very much for watching this uh, reaction video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you found it educational. And I'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.